Two of these were Robert Gallo from the National Cancer Institute and Max Essex from Harvard, who had made public speculations by 1982 that AIDS might be caused by a retrovirus. Gallo's earlier research with retroviruses in the cancer program had been a failure. None of the viruses he studied could be directly linked to the cause of a disease, and his research yielded no benefit to the patient whatsoever. But one of us, HTLV-3, got Gallo's full attention. It was this virus, or as Gallo claimed, a variant of it, that would become the virus that causes AIDS. Yes! Fight that! Fight that! Fight that! Riding the whirlwind of public demand, Gallo made his move. On April 23, 1984, Secretary of Health and Human Services Margaret Heckler and Robert Gallo called a press conference together that would involve the United States Department of Health in what critics claim would become the biggest medical scientific blunder of all time. First, the probable cause of AIDS has been found, a variant of a known human cancer virus called HLT HTLV-3. With HTLV-3, Gallo's white elephant virus program made the jump from the cause of cancer to become the cause of AIDS and the target of billions of dollars in research funds. Simultaneously, as the press conference was going on, the test used to detect HIV was being patented, which would earn the U.S. Department of Health over $100 million a year and large financial kickbacks to Robert Gallo. The AIDS industry was born, and the U.S. government was now fully invested. Naively, Secretary Heckler predicted that a vaccine would be ready for testing by 1986. We hope to have such a vaccine ready for testing in approximately two years. For the moment, everyone was happy about the discovery of the probable cause of AIDS. Gay activists were satisfied that the government was finally doing something. But the public was not aware that Gallo had bypassed a major checkpoint before making his announcement. He had not submitted his test results to other scientists for peer review. No one had a chance to critique or verify his claim, and his test results were not published in Science Magazine until one week after the press conference. This was a dangerous violation of scientific protocol. Suddenly, a challenge to Gallo's ethics emerged, which would become an international scandal. The Institut Pasteur in Paris claimed that Gallo's AIDS virus was identical to LAV, a virus Dr. Luc Montagnier had sent Gallo's lab six months before the press conference. The French were outraged and filed an international lawsuit against the U.S. Health Department on grounds that Gallo had pirated their discovery. The entire incident was embarrassing to the United States and had to be resolved diplomatically by President Reagan and Prime Minister Jacques Chirac of France. With this arrangement to split the profits made on the HIV blood test, the virus was given a new international name, the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. Despite questions of Gallo's character and ethics, HIV had now gained international acceptance. But when Gallo's HIV results were finally published in Science Magazine, only 44 of 93 AIDS patients he tested, that's less than half, had the virus. Yet Gallo claimed that in further step, he could find HIV in up to 90% of those he tested. As other virologists reproduced Gallo's research, they found similar correlations between HIV and AIDS patients. This high correlation seemed convincing to everyone that HIV must have something to do with causing AIDS. Everyone, that is, except Dr. Peter Duesberg. At the University of California in Berkeley, Duesberg became a world-renowned retrovirologist in the cancer program and the first man to map the genetic structure of retroviruses like HIV back in 1970. His honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences due to his discovery of cancer-causing genes. Having researched retroviruses for over 30 years, some have called him the world's foremost expert in retrovirology. Dr. Duesberg was somewhat skeptical of Gallo's AIDS virus announcement. I wasn't madly impressed by it because what else would you expect from a person like Gallo who had studied retroviruses all his life that he would say retroviruses cause AIDS. Yeah. That seemed to me the first coincidence that made me wonder whether that was an authentic claim or going to be an authentic claim but um, I would say uh, it was not a surprise that he would say that. He said it before that it would cause leukemia or 
things like Alzheimer's disease, neurological diseases, and it failed. So this one, I was not too impressed that this would, was going to be a winner now. And it would have been for the first time that a retrovirus would have been pinned down as a cause of a human disease, or even a disease in wild animals. For 18 months, Peter Duisberg studied every scientific publication on HIV and AIDS he could get a hold of. When he finally published his observations in cancer research in 1987, he stood alone against the tide of popular opinion and the government-funded AIDS industry. His position has become well known. He argues that HIV is not causing AIDS. It's a harmless passenger virus that has lived in humans for centuries without causing diseases. He believes AIDS is the result of other non-infectious factors like drug use. And ironically enough, AZT, the highly toxic medication prescribed to treat AIDS patients, actually does what the virus cannot, that is, causes AIDS itself. Though Dr. Duesberg's arguments were ridiculed by many and ignored by most, many of his colleagues studied his research and came to the same conclusion. 